Welcome to ServiceNet Spotlight. I'm Amy Swisher, Vice President of Community Relations for ServiceNet, and your host for this program that features the people and services that are making a difference every day throughout Western Massachusetts. We've come through an especially tough winter this year with that extended Arctic blast, and it was very busy for all of the shelters that ServiceNet runs in Northampton, in Greenfield, and in Pittsfield. But it's not just a winter problem. Homelessness is a year-round concern for many people and for many different reasons. Today we're going to be talking with Katie Mernecki, who is the program director of our ServiceNet shelters in Hampshire County. And she'll talk about the ways that ServiceNet is working to move people out of homelessness every day and throughout the year. So Katie, let's start with an overview of the services that are offered. Um, in your programs, mm -hmm. and when I say Hampshire County, we'll define that more specifically. But I know you, from, from warm meals and a place to stay to resource centers that people can tap throughout the day, you offer such a variety. So um, why don't we start with the shelters, okay. since we um, just, just mentioned that. And how many are there in Hampshire County, and, and who do they serve, and what are the specific services they offer? Okay, the, we, I oversee two homeless shelters in Northampton. Um, the Interfaith Winter Shelter that's open in the winter time from November 1st through May 1st. And the Grove Street Inn Shelter that's open all year long. So the Grove Street Inn is a different kind of shelter? One's an emergency or? or They're both oh. emergency mm -hmm. shelters. Um, the Interfaith Winter Shelter is open um, from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. and people can stay there up to 30 nights um, unless they're needing more help um, if they're working with a caseworker at a resource center um, we do give out extensions the Grove Street Inn and people at the interfaith shelter people can line up at 530 the doors open at 6 o'clock um, once they obtain the bed they can keep that bed for 30 days as long as there's no behavioral concerns and they're sober and the Grove Street Inn Shelter, uh, we work off of a waiting list. So it's still considered as an emergency shelter, um, but we work off of a waiting list and we're constantly full. So people not necessarily show up at the shelter, they call in and get themselves on the waiting list. So might people go to the emergency or to the interfaith shelter first in the winter time and then kind of move along? Correct. Into yes. the Grove Street, uh, Grove Street Inn? The Grove Street Inn Shelter. Okay. And the Grove Street Inn Shelter, you can <coughs> stay up to 60 days. And again, it's a sober shelter, and as long as there's no behavioral concerns, they can apply for an extension if they're needing more time. Now this winter, I mentioned the Arctic blast, and I know there was a period of time where um, normally people leave the shelter in the morning, mm -hmm. and they may, they may go to the resource center, which is right in the same building. They may Correct. go um, around town. They may go to jobs, as we've learned. There are people in shelters who are employed. Yes. Um, they just are not don't have the resources right at this point to go uh, go fund an apartment um, on their own. But um, during the Arctic blast period, which was a good, we, we thought it was going to be a week, and then it was two and a half or three. Ten days. Ten <laughs> days. It felt, <laughs> felt like longer. Yes. Um, where where the, the shelter was open throughout the day. And I know that was, there were a lot of people in the community who rallied to make that happen which was really good. Mm -hmm. But normally people would be out of the shelter during the day. How about at Grove Street? Might they? So Grove Street, Monday through Friday, the, gro uh, the shelter closes at 8 a.m. And mm -hmm. we encourage everyone to go to the Resource Center, which is, like you said, it's the same place at the in as the Interfaith Shelter, um, where we have case managers and healthcare for the homeless is there. We have a doctor on site, social workers, and different service providers come through the Resource Center. Um, to help with whatever the help is needed. And you also have computers, so if people are they looking access, for jobs or, or looking for housing, housing search, or yes. connecting with educational opportunities, mm -hmm. there's all that. So the function of casework in the shelters is what, or in the, at the resource the center. Resource center. Um, when someone comes in and they have a caseworker, do they hook up with one caseworker who kind of follows them? along or is it just whoever happens to be there that day? That's, uh, well we do when someone comes into the resource center we do an intake um, just to get basic information what they're needing help with and then we will assign them a caseworker, appropriate caseworker that will follow them until they get housed. So that when, when you're at a point where you are without a home mm -hmm. 
and where a lot of things may have just happened in your life, from losing a job, losing a house in a fire, whatever the circumstances may be, it seems to me having that caseworker to just kind of help you hold it together Correct. during a yes. tough time would make all the difference. Absolutely. And people come into the Resource Center, which, as I said, it's in the same building, and that's open year-round. Correct. So even when the Interfaith Shelter is closed come May 1st, people can still go to the Resource Center. Absolutely. Right. So um, so having that as, a, as kind of a tap route and, and a, a, a place to go to, I'm sure, is clearly a help for the people in one or the other of the shelters. But there are other people from the community who come into that. Um, yes, so anyone that's living in a subsidy housing, mm -hmm. um, low-income housing, will come into our resource center for whatever reason, they're, if they're in a crisis or um, they're behind on rent or their food stamps was cut off or anything mm -hmm. like that or mass health issues, uh, we do work with those individuals at, as well. I've seen people a couple times when I was in there coming in and they just need admittance. Yes. They were, <laughs> they were on the street. They were in between places, mm -hmm. they were they were cold, and you do what you can. Absolutely. Someone else, I think, needed a bus ticket mm -hmm. to get to a medical appointment in Springfield, and so yeah, it's it's a great resource. And I know we've talked numbers, and generally speak, I was just astounded at the number of people who come through that resource center in Northampton every year, and it was in the neighborhood of four thousand, as I recall. Yes. So that's that's people coming. There's a lot of people who need some kind of help, and I'm so glad you're there to, to fill that need. So when people have come through and they're ready to move on to more permanent housing, um, they've done their 30 days at the Interfaith Shelter, or they've maybe gone on to Grove Street, mm -hmm. and they've been there a couple of months, what are, do they just tend to go into their own apartments, or what are, what are some of the different options that Most people have? Most of the service providers that we work with are subsidized housing. I oversee t three houses, um, total of 32 units um, that is based on your income, so it's 30% of your income. Um, and we, our case managers follow, it's, it's considered as permanent supportive housing. And those individuals that are housed in our permanent supportive housing are the chronically homeless and most vulnerable. Um, so they are attached to a caseworker that that caseworker will work with them on a regular basis. Sometimes we start off with a weekly meetings and then once they are stable enough, then maybe a monthly, but we, it's called permanent supportive housing because the support is there. And so you said three houses, so what, what are those? So there's Yvonne's house on mm -hmm. Straw Avenue in Florence, so it houses six individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, the Florence Inn in Florence, which houses 14 individuals, um, and Holly Street in Northampton has 12 indi individuals. So these are, it sounds like maybe sort of more akin to rooming houses versus apartment buildings? Yes, they're shared. So mm -hmm. Holly Street, there's six two-bedroom apartments, so two people share a bathroom and a kitchen and living space. Mm -hmm. um, the Florence Inn, it's an SRO, single room occupancy, so they are sharing kitchen and bathroom and as well with um, with Yvonne's house. Okay, so there, it's more like a, a congregate housing um, situation. And then are there people who move into apartments but still would stay connected to caseworkers? Yes, so we work with different housing agencies in the mm -hmm. community um, and they also need support. So they also utilize the resource center and the caseworkers that we have at the resource center and outreach workers. So what, what is your goal in any given year in terms of getting people, moving people from the shelter into something more permanent, uh, whether it's the supported housing or into, I mean, do, do you move most people into permanent housing of some kind um, when they've come through the Grove Street Inn, for instance? I would say uh, probably 80% move into their own housing. Mm -hmm. um, others will reunite with their families um, or find someone, a find a room, and they move on their own. But most of the individuals that come through our shelters need that help and um, are housed with, with us. It's a really important point to make that it's, yes, there's shelter there. We don't want people on the street, especially when it's cold. Mm -hmm. We don't want people on the street and and drifting without services, whether it's cold or warm. And so shelter is really key, um, but that's not the end point. It's no. not just 
there will always be homeless, let's have a shelter. It's, it's really let's move people um, along as they're willing to be moved. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, this is not something that we force on anyone. So Katie, what are some of the more common causes of homelessness? The, I'm sure there are many more than we can list, but what are some of the things that typically lead to someone um, seeking shelter and or the resource center? Uh, well, there's mental health issues, addiction, domestic violence, unemployment, low income. Um, the list goes on. You say low income. There, there are a lot of people who are low income, but low income can also mean you're just one paycheck away from Correct. not being able to afford the rent. Yeah. And fire, I mentioned earlier. I mean, that's not a common occurrence, but... Um, Natural disasters happen uh, as well. Sure, sure. So... Um, so those would be reasons, and and uh, as you address them, I'm sure you address them each as here's not just the person who lost their job, but here's an individual who lost their job who had this kind of employment before. It's each story is different. Absolutely, yeah. every case is different. Yeah, yeah. And how many people in a year? We talked about the the sheltering that you offer in in Hampshire County specifically. How many people about are served? Both shelters uh, would be 350. 350, and then, and I mentioned earlier, um, Greenfield and Pittsfield, which also have shelters. Mm -hmm. um, both of them have, I think, family shelters as well as shelters for individuals. Correct, so the, um, including the uh, family shelters, the Berkshire, Franklin, and Hampshire County shelters um, about 870. 870 people each year. 870 people per year, and then I know we talked a staggering number of people who come through the resource center between between your resource center and the one in, in Greenfield alone. Mm -hmm. It was about 5,000 altogether. Correct. So, yes. yeah, well, it, it is remarkable work you do. Thank um, you. I, I, have, I have actually enjoyed my time in the shelter, seeing people connect in ways that are really special and important. Mm -hmm. And um, I just I want to thank you for being with us thank and you. for shedding some light on this. And is there anything you would say that people in the community could do to help? Uh, the shelters are always looking for volunteers as well as donations as bedding or linens or um, toiletries, toiletry. there you food. Go. <laughs> yeah. Any household items um, because when people are moving out into their own places, we also need furniture. Um, so anything, any kind of household items would be greatly appreciated. And cash donations are terrific, Always too. Always nice. You know, what was especially moving for me this winter is we had a, some media coverage during, during the, the um, Arctic blast mm -hmm. period, um, and, and people were quite concerned that they did not want, people in the community were very concerned about that and the impact on people who are homeless. The donations just came pouring in. Your office was full to I the ceiling. I couldn't get into my office. <laughs> one <Yeah>. weekend. <laughs> yeah, one weekend story. It was story. wonderful, yeah. absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and you realize how much difference a blanket makes absolutely. or a scar for a mm -hmm. pair of mittens. So, so thanks to the community for pitching in and helping out, and the door is always open to help throughout the year because, as we said at the outset, this is not just a winter problem. Right. All right. Thank you, Katie, Thank for being you. here and for all the work you do throughout the year. Thank you. I'm Dr. Anna Raymond in Dialectical Behavior Therapy. We help people learn adaptive coping skills even if they grew up not having access to them. People are so happy to have received what we can offer here and call it a life-changing experience. ServiceNet's Developmental and Brain Injury Services Division, which is known as DBIS, is well known for providing group living situations and also shared living throughout Western Massachusetts. The division also provides outreach to people who are living a little bit more independently in the community, whether maybe in their own place or with a family member or with a roommate. And with us today is Sean Rivard, who is a counselor with the DBIS Outreach Program and he supports people's independence every day as they live out there in the community. So I'm delighted to have you here with us. Thank you. Um, I, I met Sean when we went to a meeting with the outreach team and I was really impressed with um, what you said about the work you do and also about where you'd come from. So before we even get into what outreach is, um, 
Tell me what you did before you joined the ServiceNet team. Uh, basically, I grew up in a city environment and it was all hands-on labor work. Uh, I know how to weld, I've done body, you know, auto body tech work. Uh, the last job I had was fiberglass fabricator, where we were actually building boats and everything out of fiberglass down in Newport, Rhode Island. I moved up here and for the last 17 years I've been around the services. Uh, ServiceNet was the first one that I applied for and I got into. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been a rich and rewarding time in my life. The 17 years that I put mm -hmm. into it has changed me you know, as a person and everything, and how I care about other people now. And what, what was it that drew you to this work when you came up here from, from Newport? Uh, my family members were in residential housing doing uh, counseling, mm -hmm. and they interested me into it, and, you know, and I was kind of interested, and I wound up being a job coach for us. And I was taking a group of guys out, and we were working at the the boulders over in Amherst, they were, their job was to clean the hallways and everything, mm -hmm. and that's where I first got to know how each individual is a little bit different. Just because they're all in the same services doesn't mean that each person in the services is the same. Some people need help with math, some people need help with just communicating with people, so the more that I could learn, the more I liked it, and that's where I am now. It's like, you know, it, every day is a different day. It's not the same routine over and over. That was one thing that impressed me about you and, and a couple of the other folks we talked to is this is a, a good role for people who don't like to do the same old, same old thing Correct. every day. Correct. That you never know. You'll never get tired of your job because you yeah. never know what's going to come up. So you always have to be on your guard and on your, on your feet, keep, keep your wits about you. So the first job, it sounds like you were doing some, as you said, job coaching and maybe working in an area that was familiar to, to you. You'd done a lot of hands-on labor right. work yourself. Now you've got maybe more variety um, in what you do. What, what are some of the, and, and let's, let's, let's just back up a little bit and talk about the, the people that you work with um, in this division. Are these folks who have some kind of developmental disability or autism or Correct. brain injury? Correct. Right, so now, right, right now where I am with Coolidge and the outreach, I'm mm -hmm. dealing a lot more with the autism and brain injury. Mm -hmm. But when I first started ServiceNet 17 years ago, it was more like learning disabilities or uh, even motion. Some of the guys were really heavy and you know they're not so active, so you had to get them out and try to get them to do some kind of exercise, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So it runs the gamut, but, yeah. but as, the, as the name of the division implies, developmental disability and brain right. injury or intellectual disability is another, Correct. another term for it. And another, another thing I remember, this very memorable conversation <laughs> we had initially when I met you was um, yeah, there were folks in the group who said, you know, if you met the people we work with in the community, you might not know you that they had any kind of problem or were any different until you maybe got to a point where there was a handling money and counting change Correct. or or some other thing that was difficult right. for them. So so what are some of the things you do in a typical day to support <coughs> folks who are dealing with these challenges in their everyday lives? It, every day is there's different individuals. So on certain days I'll take them grocery shopping and one individual has trouble of keeping track of the money. So they might grab a lot of groceries by themselves and when they get to cash out, they're putting stuff back because they went over the money they have and it makes them feel bad in the community. Mm -hmm. Me just being there going with them, they can pick what they want, but I keep track of the price. So I don't let them go over their budget. Mm -hmm. So when they cash out, it's a good you know, environment. Everything feels good. They feel good shopping. They didn't have no hassles or they didn't run into any problems, you know. And do you sometimes work with people on, on actually getting that budget put together? So to get through your month, here's your income and... That's uh, the program directors and okay. uh, the site managers. Mm -hmm. I'm more like a social worker, I would, I would have to say, because mm -hmm. I keep track of their money when we're there. If they have any bank statements or any kind of letters from any, anywhere, I bring that all back to my program director and my site supervisors and they handle the booking part. I'm more 
You're in the field. Yeah, I'm more like yeah. relationship or like mm -hmm. I said, like social because some of them have social problems where they they don't know how to react to a joke. They don't know if a joke's, they won't laugh. They don't know how to express themselves that way. Mm -hmm. So I'll be there to let them know, he's only joking around, it's okay. And they, they, then they understand, oh, he was joking. It wasn't him trying to pick on me because of my disability. And do you, do you find that things change over time? Like, as you point out, oh, yes. someone, he's only joking, it's okay. Yeah. That over time, do people get they to the... Uh, yeah, they get to it and they understand that mm -hmm. every time somebody's saying something, they're not picking on you because of your disabilities. Maybe that's how they grew up in school. Or, you know, when they were younger, they were picked on, so they get secluded. Now, mm. I try to help them realize that everybody is not that way. We, we accept, we try to understand and we help them out the best we can, you know? So you're really, it sounds like you're really, you're listening a lot every day. You're paying attention to cues. Yes. And, and, and you're, you're following what the person needs. Exactly. And so, uh, grocery shopping, one example, what are some other things you might? Uh, just taking them out in a social uh, environment, taking them to McDonald's to eat, because maybe they sit in their house all day playing video games nowadays, you know? Uh, and that's their, that's their routine. So if you come over and they're happy to see you because now they know they're going out to McDonald's or just taking a ride around. We went to uh, Mount Sugarloaf mm -hmm. and I took four individuals up to the flag way up top and they loved it. They've never been up there and they lived here their whole lives. So, so you, 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 you open up the horizons right. literally there from <laughs> there, <yeah>. top <laughs> of Sugarloaf. You see all the way down the valley. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was, it was a nice day too. I had a lot of fun with the guys, you know. And, and what's their response? I mean, well, the response to that was they were excited. The response to everyday help, what kind of feedback do you get in the course of your day from the people you work with? Uh, they, <laughs> they all say they like me the best, of course. You know how that is. Uh, you're the best, Sean. I'm so glad you were, you were here. But I take that in a little bit of stride because they're feeling the emotions. And that's the way they're expressing mm -hmm. the emotions is I'm the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But really, I'm not the best thing in the world. I just do my best. Sometimes I have to redirect them, you know. Sometimes they get a little bit off, off path and I have to redirect them back to where they need to go. But all in all, we have a good time and they go home, they're happy, there's no problem, so. Well, you know, when you say, when, when, when they say, you're the best, Sean, it may be that they're feeling the best themselves when they're with you. Correct. That's what I, I'm hearing a lot, yeah. is that as, as people are gaining skill, as they're gaining perspective on right. something like that was just a joke. Um, and after a while they realize, yeah. oh, they're only joking and then they start joking back. It makes, a, it makes a world of a difference if you can be mm. like the bumper in mm. between to help them understand a few different things. Yeah, yeah, that's, so what, what uh, I know I, I, I wanted to ask you, what, what, what are some of the surprises you've come across over, over the course of your, your work here? And, one that we talked about is that people don't necessarily um, look or behave at first glance like they've got a problem. Um, are there are there some some um, challenges? I guess that that people have overcome. And you said, "Wow." I think the major challenge that I've reached lately is with the autism, because I've never been really in around or you know in that field, and I realized that. Autism people are very smart. They're very quite capable of getting their own jobs, it's, you know, uh, but their expressions or their emotions or how they're feeling, that's where they have the trouble. They don't know how to express their anger. Mm. Like to them, there could be a little thing that's wrong, but to in their head, they're thinking anger way up here. So you have to bring them down and let them understand it's not that bad. We, we'll get through this. We just handle this and we move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So that's been the biggest challenge because autism is very hard. Uh, other people you can read. You can see that in their face if they're a little bit upset. You know, you learn to read their body and how it moves and how they're talking. Autism is very hard because they don't really have expressions. So pay, paying attention to those, those subtle cues is, is where a major thing. you're really leading folks to a different way of understanding themselves. Right. And that is when, when, because working with folks who are autistic is relatively new in, in your division. Um, that there, there were people with, with, um, with autism who were not receiving services up until, what, a couple years ago? Three, four years ago? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I 
probably have the three or four years wrong, yeah. but anyway, it's not. And, and prior to that, in, in your 17, your tenure, you worked more with people who had a developmental disability. Right. Either speech or learning disabilities, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now with the autism, there's different levels that I didn't know either. There's, like I said, the higher function autism people, mm -hmm. and then there's the lower ones, which really, they have to be set in a routine. Mm. And if you break the routine, if you're even five minutes late, it throws them all off their day. Yeah. So. So learning to work within the, the yeah, within confines. That, oh, yeah. it can be tough sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are there any, um, how, I mean, so how many people do you work with in a given week? Or on, on your uh, caseload? On mm -hmm. a given day, I'll have anywhere from four to six people. Mm -hmm. So within the course of a five-day period, maybe like, I, sometimes it's the same person within the week. Mm -hmm. But if you're just going to count how many people I visit, probably like 30 people within a week. And would some people be, you'd, you'd see some people a couple times or three times a Correct. week? Correct. Okay. It so matters how, like, how much uh, time they need. They might need to go and do their laundry. So we'll be scheduled to take them for the laundry. Then the next day somebody might take them to go grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. Then the next day maybe somebody will just take them on an outing. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to go shopping at Walmart or Target. So we'll take them there so they, they can get out into the environment. It, it's the kind of service that is invisible in some ways because you're just out and about with someone helping them Correct. and it's not real clear that you're a counselor. You're, you could be a family member or friend. And I've been um, called that, believe it or not. I've had some people, is this your brother? Because I look like the client, you know. And I'm like, no, no, I'm just his. And I don't call myself staff. I don't call myself, you know, I say I'm a friend. Yeah. Basically, that's how I break it down. I'm just his friend, just helping him out today, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to use counselor. I don't like to use, you know, any, I'm his staff because that just puts the wrong picture, you know. Yeah, you know what you are, but as far yeah. as the, the person you're working with goes, having right. that trusted friend, I'm sure, is what makes yeah. all the difference. I think so. It also makes all the difference when you're someone who really loves what you're doing. I, I enjoy it a a lot. <laughs> Almost <laughs> made a bad word. <laughs> I enjoy it a lot. Uh, it's changed, like I said, it's changed me for who I was before I was more self-centered. Just cared about, you know, going to work, making my money and getting my things in life. I came up here and I realized that a lot of people don't have, you know, I may not have as much as this person, but they have even less than me. And that's what really got me into it. And speech problems, kind of, it, it was okay with me if they, they didn't want to speak, but I would make them speak. And even though they couldn't speak right, I would listen. And I'd try to understand what they're trying to say. And when I would say, are you saying this? Yeah, yeah, they would be happy that I got it. So that really got me more and more interested in service net in the field. Well, and it's like you say, you've, you've learned and you've grown from this. And right. part of that is almost learning. When you listen, you learn the language of Correct. whoever it is you're, you're working with. Yep. Well, so. you, oh, you'll see their body. Like I said, you can tell by their body tone or their look on their face. And if mm -hmm. you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't know that they're having a bad day. But when I go to somebody and they come walking out, hi, Sean, uh-oh, what's wrong? It's automatic to me. If they come out, how you doing today, Sean? All right, it's going to be a good day. You know, if I had a family member who needed to have someone go around with him or her, um, through the day and take them to places. I would totally trust you. <laughs> this you. is just Thank such so a, much. it's such a, a, a big job that you do and you do it with such grace and I really, I really appreciate you shining a light on this for people who are listening because as I say it is, it's not a, a, a home that we can look at and say that's right. where people provide service. Um, you're not necessarily identifiable with a big staff badge on you, right. um, <laughs> I don't but I, I want people out there to know what, what this outreach team does, and, and it's, it's exciting to know yeah. um, more about your work. Thank you so much for being yeah. with us today, and I appreciate all the work you do throughout the week, throughout the year. Oh, thanks.